Because the next one is Ron Phillips. He yeah. raised his hand. Oh, you know what? With segue, we've got Ron Phillips with a question, and he's going to give the next talk. So we're going to create a natural transition right now. Ron, please go ahead. OK, uh, yeah. Can you everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect. OK. Uh, well, first of all, first of all I uh, I always liked hearing about the the brick the brick standard. Uh, I actually have a proposal called uh, the beer standard, mm -hmm. and it's a proposal related to uh, local currencies. So if you go to my uh, website, uh, then you can you can see where I, this is a talk I gave a few, few years ago, talking about the uh, domestic currencies, uh, the, the history of uh, domestic currencies in the United States, <clears throat> and many of those. Uh, started with industrial companies. And um, so you know, we in Fort, where, Fort Collins, where I live, we have lots of microbreweries. And I've talked about why not just start for local currency, a, a glass of beer. You know, if you like the beer, you trust the, the company, uh, it's producing it, uh, you know, why not go for it? But again, it's an idea about local currencies, which I kind of like that idea as well. And it was uh, Professor C.O. Hardy who was the one who originated that, that Professor Friedman talks about in his yeah. article about commodity uh, yes, reserve. Yes, now I remember that, money. yes. Yes, but it, it, it's very interesting. And in my presentation, I, I use that as an example before I talk about the, the beer standard, yeah. but it, it is a, a very interesting, so I enjoyed that. Okay, on to your presentation. Okay, and I just sent some links that I'll, I'll talk about in my, um, uh, presentation uh, in, sent through the chat. So, and uh, I've enjoyed all of this uh, today, uh, all the presentations, and I don't want to repeat what a lot of people have said. I agree with, I think, most of what was been said to, uh, today and then and yesterday, especially with Professor uh, Kotlikoff. But the first thing I, I want to say is how I got into this was uh, when I retired to Fort Collins, Lloyd Mintz was alive and living here in a retirement home. Lloyd Mintz came to the University of Chicago in 1919. And though it's been recognized by a lot of people, uh, Friedman and others, the importance of Mintz, I think in general, people haven't really appreciated, you know, Mintz's contribution. Mintz came to the University of Chicago, 1919, and started teaching money and banking. So Mintz was very influential. Uh, I put up on YouTube the uh, a, a TV interview with Mintz made on his 100th birthday in 1988. Now, the second thing this ties in with is, of course, Mintz is the one who, who told me about Henry Simons and the proposal. And what I always think about with Simons is what he, he saw as the um, um, financial, what he called the financial good society. And here's his... Uh, Simon's description of a financial good society. First of all, all money is fiat money issued by the government. The treasury and the Fed are basically collapsed into one. All money, and it's fiat money, not based on debt or anything, <clears throat> and the government monetary and fiscal policy would be the same thing. So then you would debate about, well, what should the government uh, spend it's money on, and you can debate whether you want it defense or, or, or climate uh, uh, infrastructure, all those types of things. So <clears throat> that is the only thing that would be money would be that issued by, by the government. Banks would be subject to 100% reserves. So they would have to hold 100% in, in government uh, fiat money uh, as the asset against any deposit deposits they might issue. Now, <clears throat> the credit side, so that's the fiat money is the payment system. The credit side is going to be, as Professor Kotlikoff discussed, basically equity banking, mutual fund banking, whatever you want to call it. Simon said that what you should have is infant maturity debt or consoles. So it would be debt that was, you know, with a maturity of 100 years, let's say. 
that effectively is equity, basically, if you think about it, because you can, you can sell it at any time at the market rate. So I think you have to keep this in mind. The crucial thing is there's two things, the payment system and the credit system. And if we wanted the simplest of all worlds in which people could understand, it would be Simon's Financial Society. And that's precisely what Simon said, it's too simple of a, of a world for, for people to go along with, and especially, of course, bankers and others that, that benefit. So, so that's, that's where I start with, thinking about payments and credit. Now, in terms of examples, we've already heard discussions of the national banking system, which worked uh, uh, very well. I've done some empirical uh, work on, the, on this, and the national banking system was helping to bring about um, par clearance in the domestic exchanges uh, during the time of the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. When we <clears throat> got the Federal Reserve notes after 1935, up until 2008, they were Federal Reserve notes were backed basically 100 percent or close to 100 percent by safe U.S. government securities. So that's an example. During the crisis in the 19 uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s, there was a proposal by Bob Lighton and others about narrow bank. That again fits uh, fits with it. Now this brings us to the current to the present thing. We've already had lots of discussion about the central bank digital currencies. And I think that's definitely something interesting. So whether you talk about having a digital currency, allowing people to have uh, accounts at the Fed, individuals to have accounts at the Fed, or even, you know, there's some people are talking about the postal, postal savings uh, system that we had at one time. It was eliminated in the 1930s. All of those things would, would give us uh, a stable payment system that, that would preclude banks from creating money. So that's all, that's all good. Uh, the other thing that has uh, uh, developed is, yeah, there's cryptocurrencies, but there's also the stable coins. And it's, that's been mentioned as well. Uh, the links that I put, put uh, on the chat room, uh, the first is, of course, just the YouTube of Lloyd Bentz. The second is about the Treasury's report about stable coins and about regulating stable coins. Well, this uh, guy, the third link is from Franklin Knoll, who is a Treasury historian, and he um, has, has a proposal to use the National Banking Act as a way to regulate uh, stable coins. And I think that's very, that's very interesting, and it's, it's entirely appropriate. So, you know, you know, my, my uh, perspective from, you know, the time I've spent studying the financial history of the United States is that we know how to have safe and stable banking. We know how to make the payment system safe. And digital, uh, central bank digital currencies are the stable coins. These are ways which move us toward a safe payment system in which we don't need federal deposit insurance and we don't we don't have the banks creating money. Now, that, of course, uh, on, on the credit side, um, that leaves uh, a question of what we do. Is that going to be all a private sector? Uh, I don't have a problem with uh, the federal government uh, issuing uh, uh, debt if it then uh, allocates that money toward, you know, projects and things that, that we really think will, will help improve the, improve the economy. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, but, you know, in the modern money theory, uh, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what that idea is, but basically the modern money theory, I think says, look, we've are, we, can, we can already basically print the money and pay for whatever we want. By the way, uh, well, one other, other thing that, that Simon said about why this, his system, this financial good society would be, would be, uh, so simple and understandable is if you had only the government uh, creating this fiat currency, if it caused inflation, it would be very clear this was the cause of inflation. So it, it's, it, it'd be so, it would be so simple and easily understandable. But the system we have now, as it's evolved in history, it just confuses everybody. When you start talking about what's the role of the treasury, well, yeah, the treasury could, and it did, you know, print silver certificates, 
printed greenbacks. It's done, it's done lots of things in history, and it could still, I believe, do those things if, if it wanted. But it gets very confusing now when, when people see, talk about the Federal Reserve creating money. I don't want the Federal Reserve going out there and making loans to anybody. It's okay if the Treasury does that. And, <clears throat> but right now we've got those, those things separate. Again, in, in Simon's view of the financial good society, what you would have is monetary and physical policy are the same thing, subject to a rule and a guide on, on the price level. I think that's something to think about. Not that we can achieve that, but it is a very uh, good way, I think, to sort of conceptualize what the problem is. So that actually is... is what I, I want to say, I have, I have, I've talked about this lot, a lot, and I've had, you can look at my website for some podcasts and things that I, I have done on this, but I think uh, we've, we've generated, there's been a lot of interesting talks and discussions today, and I'd be happy just to open things up to questions at this point. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Ronnie Phillips, wonderful, and uh, um, <laughs> give me some of that old time love. <laughs> give me some of that old time. <laughs> and um, here we go. Um, questions, thoughts? We'll get Sue. Um, I think if Sue Peters, if we could find Sue and bring her, put her forward here. One second. And then <laughs> I'm you, you Sue. Left. Thank you. Okay, Sue, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great, great. Um, thank you, Ron. Um, I have this question that has been on my mind for the last couple months. Will, yes. the federal, will the Federal Reserve law have to be changed for this country to have central bank digital money from the Fed system? Uh, I don't think so. You know, I, I've thought about this in the past, and I think I think the key thing here is that anything issued by either the Treasury or the Federal Reserve is legal tender. So I, I, I think they can do whatever whatever they want in terms of, of creating money. Um, so I, I don't I don't I don't that I know of. I don't think I don't see uh, any barrier to that. I'm not an expert in all the legal aspects of the Federal Reserve Act, but I don't see why it's any different than what they do now in terms of, you know, they use the computers to create money anyway. So I don't see that as a problem, but it would be legal tender. It would be legal tender. Now, that is something um, that that might have an impact in terms of, you know, if you've got, um, you know, the company Circle has the their U.S. digital coin or, do, or U.S. digital coin dollar coin which is a digital uh, currency uh they might see that as sort of you know competition but um there shouldn't there shouldn't be any legal restriction that i know of someone else knows i mean i, I don't however, think so however the current federal reserve law when the federal reserve regional banks issue um our uh paper currency are Federal Reserve notes. That's a debt, a debt of our government. It's not uh, sovereign. Well, okay, let's go. What Henry Simons had in his proposal, it wasn't, it wasn't debt. He, he basically collapsed the Fed and the Treasury together. If you put the, basically the Fed and the Treasury together, you can just, you could, you know, wipe out the debt and you're going to basically print money and go out there and buy goods and services. So uh, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, as it is now, it is, you're right. The, the Federal Reserve <coughs> uh, prints money basically and buys government securities or other assets. And then you know, return the interest, all of it. That's, that's part of the thing to kind of confuse people about what's, <laughs> what's actually going on. So it is sometimes useful. And I think, again, what modern money theory uh, does is basically 
think about collapsing the Treasury balance sheet and the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Okay, if you do that, then you get you you come to the conclusion: all we got to do is all the government has to do is print money and buy goods. Okay, thank you. Okay. Joe um, Bon Giovanni, we will. You're unmuted. Hey, Joe. Hey, Ronnie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, sorry, um, I'm trying to bridge the gap between modern monetary theory, which says it's okay, we can do everything we want as long as we just keep borrowing money to do it. Now, that's what they say on the one hand. And Henry Simon's vision for how to make, how to make a just society. And, and so to me, those, that, that's a, you know, there's an ocean, there's not an ocean big enough, you know, to, 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 to portray that gap in terms of monetary system policy. So I, I, I'm just kind of at a, at a loss and I'm going to ask you to kind of explain to me how what modern monetary theory believes in and even central bank digital currency, quite frankly, um, uh, without having a public central bank as the number one, uh, you know, the number one requirement for it. Uh, and, and, and Henry Simon's vision, which is the one that we've been pursuing as monetary reformers in this country, as you know, because you've helped me do it <laughs> substantively. Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, the Henry Simon's proposal is, you can think of it, we're going to print the money and the government's going to go out there and buy goods and services. If you want to think of it as printing up the dollar bills, they're going to go out and go out and buy. It's, it's like the greenbacks that were you know mentioned earlier that's what henry simons is talking about <clears throat> he was in favor of free enterprise for everything except money exactly. so so it's it's and and i think the the, the modern uh money uh theory people um I, I think i guess the way i like to express it and i don't know whether they'd be too crazy about this i i, I think they believe that We've already got Henry Simon's world that, yeah, we just print up the money and go out there and spend. And really? so, so therefore, the debt can can increase uh, as large as it wants. Um, so it, 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 there is a definitely a, a difference. Simon's, there's no government debt. It's fiat currency, 100 percent for the modern money theory people. Well, you can go ahead. I mean, they sort of want to get to the same thing. See, they, they still talk about inflation targets. I mean, it's so, so again, but, they're, they're collapsing it. They're collapsing the tre tre Fed and Treasury balance sheets together, but they're keeping that federal, federal debt uh, on there and then keeping the banks the, the way they are. So there is, okay. there is a, a fundamental difference with what Henry but, Simons I, but, would say. But I mean, is, it, is, is the difference more, more than to characterize it of, one of public money issuance versus one of private money issuance and the fact that modern monetary theory people want to preserve the present private money issuance system that we have in this country. I mean, like to me, that's the issue that Simons was, you know, was, was, was laying out is a matter of who creates the money. So in, in, in achieving to, uh, towards his just society, he's saying the government must create the money. And, 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 and modern monetary theory, they, they deny even that the government can create the money on the one hand, and then they tell you, no, the government's doing it right now by issuing all, these, yeah. all this debt that yeah. don't matter. Mm -hmm. But Ronnie, we're 28 or $9 trillion in debt to somebody that has to be paid back. The only one way debt can be paid back, which is with money. And so for the government to get money, it's taxation. So we already owe the financial world $29 trillion from our earnings and our income. And I'm sorry, this is not a just money system that modern monetary theory is pursuing, and neither do I see a just money system uh, uh, achievable under the, under the central bank digital currency scheme. Thank you. Well, well, certainly the digital money scheme is not going to work under the current system. Obviously, it's just going to be it's going to be the same thing that we we have. It, it would be a way uh, if you could get policymakers to agree to uh, implement the hundred percent reserve 
yeah. idea, basically. But it, it, I'm not, they're not in favor of it. I, right. I think for the MMTers, what they what they're what they're really trying to get at is to get over this this uh, deficit hawk kind of stuff. I think that's really where they're aiming at. And so if they start, I think they feel that if they're starting, if they start talking about radically changing the banking system. Oh, you know, everybody's going to get worked up about that because you got the FDIC, you know, and and all that, and the, the bankers and local bankers loan to you, you know, and all that sort of thing. So I think just as a, a political strategy, they they say, okay, we're just going to leave the bank system the way it is. But what we we can do is go ahead. The government can go ahead and spend until there's basically uh, inflation. So, um, so I think it's just, it's just the move, but, and, and I would say, you know, uh, again, they, they don't want to talk about this, but, you know, as, as I've said before, uh, I wrote my book, uh, next door to high Minsky at the Levy Institute. Minsky read my book and, and he wrote the forward to my book and Minsky liked the idea. He was a, an undergraduate student of Henry Simons and Simons you know, he, that's who he taught. It was undergraduates. And, and Minsky, in his last years, he, he really liked the 100% reserve idea for lots, lots of reasons and, and didn't see any, any big, big problems. So even though the MMTers, and Randy Ray is, again, an old friend of mine, we were together at the Levy Institute, but um, they, they, want, they want to claim, you know, Minsky and the financial instability hypothesis but not recognizing fully that Minsky, as a student of Henry Simons, really liked the 100% reserve proposal. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's kind of ironic, if you don't mind me saying so, if I still have the mic, I'm not sure. But, yeah. but you know, it's kind of, kind of ironic that, uh, that, that they, they trot out, you know, Dr. Minsky, when Dr. Minsky, you know, come, come to say it's the failures of the Federal Reserve System that is causing the institutional problems and societal problems that we're having. And, and, and we need to be studying new mechanisms in order to achieve it. Now he wasn't to me quite a monetary reformer, but he was, a, he was, a, he was an institutional politician and he was able to address the fact that our institutions are failing us back at that time in 1994, excuse me. And, and, and then, and that, and that, MMT completely missed it. You know, MMT has completely missed it and, and really almost denies it, its existence if you follow, you know, their logic. Now, he only called for a National Monetary Commission, but when you're an economist, that's as far as you can go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree. With you. And, and again, I, um, uh, I, I don't know, you, you have to get the MMTers and, and talk, talk to them about, about these ideas and more. I, I'm not, too. I'm not really an expert, you know, but yeah. that's my feelings. I'm, I've known Randy for 40 years. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Randy thank, Ray. You, thank you. And he's thank really you, the original. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ronnie. And, and um, thank you, Joe, too, for your questioning. And um, Joe Polito has his hand up, but I'm going to suggest something. If everybody, uh, who's participating can keep muting. Um, let's have Joe ask his question. And I'm gonna turn around and during this break, Joe might work to facilitate a conversation like he did during lunch a bit too. Um, so anyhow, Joe, uh, go ahead, please. If that's the price of uh, getting to ask my question then I'll, I'll accept that. Um, uh, I quite agree with Joe. Uh, the uh, there seems to be this huge gulf and inconsistency with MMT, um, uh, Kelton in particular. Uh, I put a link in the chat because in this particular three-minute segment, uh, she doesn't sound too far away. Uh, other times, it is that ocean that uh, Joe described. Um, I also have the impression from what I've been hearing today about CBDCs that if we did have them, MMT would be much, much closer to us. There wouldn't be a lot of functional difference. Uh, my question for you, um, Ronnie, is 
how does what's the relationship between CBDC and stablecoin? Thank you. The um, uh, the, the stablecoin is um, uh, again they see that as basically following in the Chicago uh, plan idea of 100% reserves. And of course there it is backed 100% by safe assets would be, uh, they're talking about short-term government security. Um, so uh, if you had, um, you know, the digital uh, central bank uh, currency, um, yeah, that would be just, be just another form. And I don't, um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think there's any, incompatibility or, or any problem with that, uh, you know, the question, and I put that link from Franklin Knoll about how you regulate those, we'd want to re regulate those stable coins. So it's sort of bringing back the National Banking Act, but for, for stable coins. So I don't see, I don't see any real problem, again, if you reform it. Now, it's not, you know, like, you, you do it like we have, leave the system like it is, it's a totally different ball game. I mean, it's not, it's not 100% reserves if you don't explicitly make that uh, a policy goal. Is that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, thank you, Ron, uh, Ron for um, your perseverance too, and your diplomacy. You, you, you could have gone to, uh, gone to diplomacy school too. And, um, <laughs> Thank you for uh, being on both sides of, of, of the fence and knowing how to get along. I will tell, I will mention one thing though, you talked about Randall Ray being at the heart of it and, and he certainly is. I have uh, both his books, Understanding Money and MMT or Modern Monetary Theory from 212. I know there's um, some textbooks that have come out since then and other things and, um, and I know Steve Keen has been getting close and he referred to some other book that I haven't read yet. Um, but the other person who's close to MMT is uh, Michael Hudson. And he's very much at the, at the heart of MMT. And in his modeling, he really likes it where money is credit, debt, credit, debt, credit, debt, and, um, and if anybody issues money, it's not really positive money. He looks at it as a debt somewhere in his modeling system. And uh, I think he comes from that. I know Michael Hudson and his first impression of it is, well, what it, are we talking about semantics or something real? And, um, and how, many, how many angels can you put on top of a pin? And, uh, I'm not, I don't know, we have our work uh, bringing these, diff, bringing ourselves together. And um, at this conference, I think Steve Keen, there's been a little opening there. He talked uh, in his talk about uh, government needing to create the money now uh, at some point. And it's, it's just working it out because there's a lot of energy that could come together if we can get on the same page. And it may be just the young people in the room doing it on their own. So, uh, <laughs> so anyhow, thank you very much, Ronnie. And, um, okay, sure. If this video is helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe for new video notifications please consider donating at monetary.org forward slash donate. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter at AMI Monetary or on our website.